Good afternoon. Now, you know, if Dr. Reed were here, she would not be pleased with that call and response, so we'll try it again. Good afternoon. All right, my name is Alden Landry. I am the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, and uh, I have the pleasure of helping to organize these equity and social justice events. Um, these events are something that are near and dear to my heart because it's often conversations that don't necessarily fit within our traditional um, educational dogma. And these are conversations that uh, our students, our residents, our faculty, our community need to hear and be a part of. So I just want to say thank you all for being here this afternoon and joining us in this conversation. Uh, I want to say thank you to the many guests that are here. We have um, from Harvard uh, HMS, uh, the Chan School, uh, Harvard School of Graduate, uh, uh, Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. We have uh, many of the hospitals represented, including Boston Children's Hospital, BIDMC, MGH, Dana-Farber, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and then we also have the Boston Public Health Commission, the Center for Surgery and Public Health. And so just thank you to all of our wonderful special guests. I especially want to recognize our speakers who are here today, uh, Dr. Dorado Brooks, uh, Dr. Kim Rhodes, and Dr. Daryl Gray. Uh, they are um, past alums of our Commonwealth Fund California uh, Endowment uh, Fellowship. And just thank you for your presence here. And then also uh, to Dr. Nadine Jackson McCleary, who is going to be leading us through this discussion, um, who uh, comes to us uh, from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, this is really a collaborative effort, um, and our co-sponsors include the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer uh, Center, the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Minority Health Policy at Harvard University, and the HMS Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. And I want to just uh, take a pause and just say a thank you to um, Teresa Carter, Ying Wong, Jackie Wright, Sheila Nutt, uh, Fari, and the rest of the uh, staff at the DICP for helping to pull this together. So if we could give them a round of applause. So this is our fourth year of doing these equity and social justice lecture series. Um, and it's really, as I mentioned earlier, the importance of this is just about having dialogues. Um, we want to make sure that we focus on what's happening within our Harvard community, but also make sure that we're extending beyond the, the borders of this campus and really include our, our community uh, in these discussions. And we, we welcome our participants from the, the greater Boston area. Uh, this series really gives context to the historical, current, and future state of health equity and social justice. Uh, in health and healthcare, and engages and equips participants with tools uh, and the ability to take action. Our ESJs focus on four major areas, including the historical context, culture and environment, health disparities, and leadership skills and development. Uh, this year's uh, ESJ lecture series will tackle specific issues focusing on disadvantaged populations and underserved patients. And our speakers um, will address um, not just defining the disparity anymore, because I think we're beyond that. We're really focusing on the interventions uh, at the community, hospital, and policy levels that will allow us to have the change that we need. Uh, for colorectal health, I'm not going to dive too much into the details, but you're going to hear from some really dynamic speakers that are going to talk to us about um, what's happening um, for underserved and marginalized communities when it comes to colorectal health screening, um, the diagnoses and misdiagnoses, um, the impacts of this disease, these diseases are on our patient populations, and how we can work together on a local uh, on a state and on a national level to really address the health disparities uh, that we've come, in, uh, come to see bear out uh, in our current healthcare system. So our format for this discussion is going to be two parts. One is going to be uh, a quick overview and introduction by uh, Nadine. She's going to give us an overview of where we're at in this current discussion. And then we're going to break down and have our panelists join us and give us their different vantage points uh, from the work that they're doing. Uh, and so I think you're going to see that this is really a 360 conversation. And we want to get you all involved in this conversation as well, and we're going to try and save time for as much Q&A as possible. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pause with my uh, opening remarks, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and transition to welcoming our, our keynote um, speaker. So with that, I want to bring up Dr. Nadine Jackson McCleary. She's a medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She obtained her BSN from the University of Pennsylvania and later obtained her MPH from Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health and continued on to receive her medical degree from that institution as well. She completed her fellowship in hematology and oncology and she joined the gastrointestinal center uh, faculty at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in 2009. Uh, Dr. McCleary has dedicated her research uh, to the development and the application of validated tools to facilitate shared decision making and improve cancer care uh, delivery. 
her initial research translated uh, patient uh, report outcomes for older uh, adults diagnosed with gastrointestinal cancers. Her current efforts entail large-scale implementation of electronic uh, PRO collection uh, at the academic institution. And among oncology uh, patients who are often marginalized by access, motivation, or stigma for electronic uh, communication. Uh, her work is funded by the Donahue Foundation, the National Cancer Institute, Friends of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and the DFCI Medical Oncology Grant. So with that, I will bring up uh, Dr. McCleary. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> so this is exciting to be able to talk about this topic uh, amongst who I consider friends and folks who are very interested in finding out more about what we can do, not just what we're going through, but what we can do about this. This is a very personal story for me. So at the start of my oncology fellowship, literally the last day of my residency at Hopkins um, in 2006, I got a phone call from my father, who is at that point 56 years old, not a man who likes to go to the doctor, married to a nurse, so forced him to go. And he had his first colonoscopy at 56, but had been bleeding for one year, unbeknownst to any of us in his family. And his PCP was aware of this, but really didn't push this need to get a colonoscopy. It's OK if you're not ready. It wasn't really pushed, even uh, with her colleague, who was my mom, a nurse working with her. Um, and so I think this just goes to show that cancer in certain populations is on the rise. It's higher in certain racial and ethnic groups, and particularly amongst African Americans, we can see higher rates of not only incidence but mortality for certain cancer types, even colon cancers, which are highly curable. This rate, um, a higher rate of incidence, is present regardless of stage of diagnosis. So for patients who uh, here compared rates per 100,000, comparing uh, African Americans to Caucasian peers um, at early stage, at local uh, stages in the middle, and the last panel C, advanced stages, uh, African Americans stand a higher rate of uh, diagnosis at each of those stages. This disparity is multifactorial. Whether you're concerned about incidence, screening, treatment, mortality, survivorship, or risk reduction, incidence, African-Americans stand third most common cancer in African-American men and women, and a 20% higher incidence despite decreasing incidence of this cancer subtype overall for all comers. They also have later referrals for screening, and amongst those who are referred for screening, there are differences amongst what type of screen is, is selected, whether it's colonoscopy versus a fecal occult blood test. Treatment, timely referral to oncology has been shown to be an issue as well. Mortality and survivorship, fewer living at five or beyond years since diagnosis. And risk reduction, as we've discussed in other forums, genetic and genomic testing is lacking in certain racial and ethnic groups, including African Americans. But there is hope. So one intervention that was conducted statewide in Delaware looked at early screening and noted that early screening leads to early detection and lower mortality. So I just wanted to take a brief moment and walk through this experience in Delaware, detailing their interventions from 2002 to 2010, where they really made a hard push to increase screening in that state, and noted that screening increased not only for African Americans who were at risk by 57% over that eight-year period, but by 28% for their Caucasian peers as well. So overall, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Each person was benefited by this intervention. Not only were we able to screen and have earlier detection, we also saw a shift in the stage. So in 2001, there were a greater number of patients diagnosed with regional disease, disease that often requires chemotherapy and or radiation therapy for rectal cancer. And by 2009, with this earlier screening effort, we're catching disease at an earlier stage, so more local and curable and resectable disease. And again, by shifting that screening, shifting to earlier detection, we also saw a decrease in mortality for patients in this subset who were monitored in the state of Delaware. Um, so this reduction um, was seen for Caucasian pairs as well, but was most notable for uh, African Americans who, up until that time, had not had similar screening rates. 
So I think this is very encouraging. Um, and as you'll hear uh, later on, uh, call to action really is one of the titles of the talks today. And I think it's a call to action for all of us. 60% of colorectal cancer disparity in many papers has been quoted as uh, can be easily addressed by screening for all eligible individuals, not just those of uh, certain racial or ethnic groups, but everyone would benefit from more aggressive and targeted screening. And the remaining 40% of this disparity that we see with colon and rectal cancer diagnosis could be tackled by addressing every phase of the cancer care continuum. So screening all the way to testing, including genomic testing, and the big data that we're mining now to develop uh, key algorithms for care. We need to determine why those differences in diagnosis and mortality occur, develop targeted interventions, and focus on survivorship and prevention strategies so we do not continue to see the same uh, disease affecting generations. So today, we are pleased to be joined by our three speakers, and I just wanted to take a moment to introduce each of them. I'll actually start with Dr. Gray first, and then end with Dr. Brooks, after which he'll come up and uh, speak to us. So Dr. Gray is an Associate Professor of Medicine at The Ohio State University College of Medicine, where he serves as Medical Director of Endoscopy and Gastroenterology Services and Deputy Director for the Center for Cancer Health Equity at OSU Comprehensive Cancer Center. He completed the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Minority Health Policy at Harvard University in 2014, Gastroenterology Fellowship at Washington <coughs> University in 2013, Internal Medicine Residency at Duke University Medical Center, Medical School at Howard University College of Medicine, and Morehouse College. Dr. Gray engineered and leads the Provider and Community Equity Engagement PACE Program for Health Equity in Colorectal Cancer Prevention, a nationally recognized initiative aimed at improving colorectal cancer screening rates. He also serves as the, on the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable Strategic Planning Advisory Group. Dr. Gray has been recognized for his work with the 80% by 2018 National Achievement Award by the NCCRT, multiple American College of Gastroenterology Awards, and with induction as a National Minority Quality Forum 40 Under 40 Leader in Minority Health. Dr. Kim Rhodes is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Director of the Office of Community Engagement for the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Deller Family CCC. Dr. Rhodes uh, has board certification in general and colon and rectal surgery and conducts health services research highlighting the relationship between delivery of evidence-based cancer care and survival disparities for racial ethnic minorities in California. Her groundbreaking work has demonstrated the link between cancer care equity and the closure of racial ethnic survival gaps in a variety of malignancies. Dr. Rhodes' longstanding commitment to community engagement as a path to eliminating disparities has led to her current roles as director of the Office of Community Engagement for the Comprehensive Cancer Center at UCSF. Dr. Rhodes obtained her MD degree from UCSF jointly with an MS in Health and Medical Science from University of California, Berkeley, and holds a master's degree in Public Health, Health Management, and Policy from the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. There she served as a California Endowment Scholar in Minority Health Policy. Dr. Rhodes founded and led the Community Partnership Program at the Stanford Cancer Institute before taking on the directorship at UCSF. And finally, Dr. Brooks has worked for the American Cancer Society's national headquarters since 2000. As the Vice President of Cancer Control Interventions, he oversees the design, implementation, and evaluation of cancer prevention and early detection programs at the national, state, and local levels to increase access to high-quality prevention and screening and to decrease cancer-related disparities. He also serves as Deputy Director of the Society's Peer Review Journal, a cancer journal for clinicians. A graduate of The Ohio State University and Wright State University School of Medicine, Dr. Brooks completed his internal medicine residency and chief residency at Wright State's affiliate hospitals in Dayton, Ohio, and practiced primary care at safety net facilities in Dayton and Texas for 15 years. 
He completed the Commonwealth Fund Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy in 1999 and holds a master's degree from the School of Public Health. He subsequently worked in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Dallas Regional Office before joining ACS. In 2015, Dr. Brooks was honored with the Prevent Cancer Foundation's Laurel Award for National Leadership in Cancer Prevention and Early Detection. And with that, I welcome Dr. Brooks. Good afternoon. It is a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, really important conversation. Um, I was asked to talk about colorectal cancer from the national perspective, and given uh, the introduction, uh, my, my bio you just heard, my focus with American Cancer Society is really around prevention and early detection. So my focus uh, of my remarks is also going to be uh, very heavily on colorectal cancer screening and why that's important. This year in the U.S., nearly 150,000 people are going to hear the words, you have colorectal cancer, just like Dr. McCleary's dad heard those words. 50,000 people, or a little more, are going to die from colorectal cancer this year in the U.S., and from my earliest days with ACS, I've been driven by the knowledge and understanding that half or more of those cases could be prevented. Half or more of those deaths don't have to occur, not because we discover something new, find some new magic bullet, just using what we have at our hands. We can make those kinds of changes. And that's because colorectal cancer is one of the very few cancers where the screening test that we use to find cancer early can also help prevent the disease. If we screen people effectively, we find and remove adenomatous polyps and keep people from ever getting cancer. So there are tremendous missed opportunities every day occurring across this country. Now, we have made a lot of progress, and the reality is it's estimated that about half a million cases of colorectal cancer haven't occurred over the last 30 years because of our screening efforts to a large degree. We've also seen very dramatic falls in colorectal cancer mortality. Um, just during the first decade of uh, the, the 21st century, from 2000 to 2011, it was a 27% drop in colorectal cancer deaths in the U.S. So clearly, we're doing some things right, but as is often the case in our healthcare system, not everybody is experiencing that same level of benefit. So we have <coughs> continuing gaps, very significant gaps in colorectal cancer. We have much higher incidence rates and death rates in certain populations. In particular, African Americans and American Indian and Alaska Natives have m much higher rates of being diagnosed with the disease and higher rates of dying from the disease than other groups in the U.S. Um, we have seen mortality rates falling in African Americans, just not falling as quickly as they have in the white population. And in American Indians, concerningly, there's some data indicating their rates are actually worsening. So, <clears throat> clearly work to be done. Again, screening can help prevent the disease. But even if we miss that opportunity for prevention, even if when we finally get around to doing that colonoscopy, we find cancer is there, can still make a huge difference because cancers of the colon or the rectum that are found in the earliest stage before they penetrate the colon wall, 90% five-year survival. Nine out of 10 people who are told you have cancer have a chance of living five years or more. Many of those folks are going to be cancer-free. On the other hand, if the disease has metastasized by the time it's diagnosed, only 14% of those folks are going to be alive five years later. So screening can prevent the disease, but also can totally change the trajectory of the disease if we do screening on time. 
And again, we're doing a really lousy job in many instances with one-time screening. Uh, again, Dr. McCleary's dad's example um, is one that we all need to keep in mind. He was 56 years old for 20, 25 years. <clears throat> every organization that publishes colorectal cancer screening guidelines has started at age 50. Yet he's 56 and symptomatic before he ever got screened. And unfortunately, that's far too common. Although screening rates have improved in the US, the last data that we have from the CDC indicates that for individuals between age 50 and 54, less than half of those folks are screened. And those are people for whom screening has been widely recommended by every organization for more than 20 years. So we've got work to do. Now, again, for at least the last 20 years, there's been consistent messages from essentially every major medical organization that for average risk individuals, you should start screening at age 50. In May of 2018, the ACS broke with that consensus, and our guidelines since that time have recommended that all average risk people, regardless of gender, regardless of race or ethnicity, everybody should start screening at age 45. We did not break with that consensus without putting a lot of thought and effort into considering all the possible ramifications. But our guidelines are evidence-based and ultimately we went where the evidence took us. And one of the main pieces of evidence was this. When this is a data that's been produced by, by a lot of different folks, but the epidemiologists that I have the honor to work with at ACS actually have done some of the similar work in this area. And notice that going back for close to 30 years now, we have been seeing that steady fall in colorectal cancer in people over age 50. But in the group between 20 and 49, a 51% rise since 1994 more and more young people being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. So this got us looking more closely at this data and every way we sliced it and diced it, it was incredibly concerning. In 1990, 6% of cases of colorectal cancer in the US were diagnosed in people under the age of 50. By 2015, that had essentially doubled, 12%. So more than one out of every 10 cases, about one out of every nine cases is now occurring in somebody under the age of 50. And for reasons that aren't clear, African Americans, Native Americans, more likely to be diagnosed with early stage disease. There also is a tendency for people with early stage disease to be diagnosed with more advanced disease because colorectal cancer Frankly, it's just, it's certainly not on the patient's mind, and oftentimes it's not even on the mind of the clinicians who are caring for them. And I'll admit to a blind spot when I was in practice. If I thought, saw a 30-year-old who came in with rectal bleeding, I would have probably treated them in the same way that Dr. McCleary's dad was dealt with. Oh, probably nothing to worry about. But that is no longer the case. Any symptoms in anyone, regardless of age, need to be taken very seriously. Um, now, the, um, the, we had a lot of pushback, I will say, when we um, published our guidelines and recommended screening beginning at age 45. And there are some reasonable and legitimate concerns. But again, for us, the evidence strongly suggests that 45 is the right age and the right age for everyone to start screening. And we do feel that we have a chance to change some of that data that you all were just looking at. The reality is though, if you look at our guidelines and those of the US Preventive Services Task Force, other than the 45 year starting age, our guidelines are almost identical. And a couple of important things to point out. Um, everyone, recommends options. Unfortunately, colorectal cancer screening in the US, in most instances, when you talk about it, people automatically go to colonoscopy. No guidelines say everybody get a colonoscopy. Even the guidelines of the GI organizations, 
promote the importance of options because not everyone is willing to have a colonoscopy. Not everyone is able to get a colonoscopy. And there are very effective screening options available. And many of these options are potentially low cost. So even people who have uh, insurance challenges or other economic difficulties can still find a way to get screened. As a matter of fact, one of the big pushbacks re related to the ACS guideline change was, well, insurers aren't going to cover screening at age 45. Well, if you're talking about a colonoscopy for everybody at 45, then, you know, that $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 can be a big challenge. But if you recognize this whole pantheon of screening options, a $25 stool test is potentially still affordable. Um, the other thing is, actually, insurers are starting to cover screening at 45 because some insurers have gone back and looked at their own data and recognized that, hey, we're seeing a lot of people under the age of 50 with colorectal cancer, and we're paying a lot of money. The last estimate I looked at estimated that treating stage 4 colorectal cancer is a $300,000-plus proposition. So maybe screening actually makes economic sense for us. So we are seeing insurers beginning to pick up on this. The other important thing, though, if we talk about these options, is the fact that colonoscopy is really the common final pathway if you are going to diagnose and treat colorectal cancer effectively. So if someone has a non-colonoscopy screening test, a stool test or virtual colon uh, colonoscopy, um, if that test is abnormal, they need to have a colonoscopy. And unfortunately, in particular with regard to stool tests, there's a lot of data now demonstrating that anywhere from a quarter to half of people who have a positive finding on a stool test still don't get a colonoscopy within the next year. And again, a body of, of work is now showing that those people are at significantly higher risk of being developed with uh, or being diagnosed with colorectal cancer in the future and dying from it. So non-colonoscopy options are great, but if they're abnormal, you've got to do the right kind of follow-up. Now, in spite of the tremendous benefits of screening, we still aren't doing a great job for the population at large. The last data from CDC indicated that about one out of three people who should be screened are not up to date with screening. And again, at the younger end of that spectrum, 50 to 54, less than half of those folks are up to date with screening. In addition, African Americans, in some places have equivalent screening rates, other parts of the country, not so much. American Indian, Alaska Natives, who already said have some of the highest rates in the country, highest rates in the world, have much lower rates of being up to date with screening. It also differs by socioeconomic status, by educational status, and insurance status in particular. The uninsured in the U.S. are about half as likely to be up, up to date with screening as more affluent groups. So a big part of the work that I do, that we at ACS have focused on, is trying to move people to take advantage of the tremendous opportunity offered by screening, and in particular trying to address the needs of a lot of those, those groups that currently aren't, um, aren't being addressed. So beyond just developing the guidelines, a lot of our work at ACS is focused on trying to actually get those guidelines put into practice. Um, for more than 20 years, we've partnered with the Centers for Disease Control in an organization called the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. That's a consortium of now more than 120 different organizations that have all come together to increase colorectal cancer screening. Um, we launched in 2014 an initiative called 80% by 2018 with the goal of getting the entire nation from 62% at the beginning of that to 80% screening across the country. And the, we fell short, but we're still moving. We're still moving forward. And we did make significant progress in a number of areas. Number one, we were able to get over 1,700 organizations to sign on to that initiative. And these are certainly a lot of different healthcare organizations and public health and government, but we also got private industry. We had employers like AT&T and FedEx who became part of that initiative. 
Um, so we, and we changed the conversation because prior to that time, we had a goal of 70% screening um, that by 2020 that was established by the federal government a number of years ago. Nobody talks about 70 by 2020 anymore. Everybody is talking about how to get to 80%. We had more than 350 organizations that were part of this initiative that actually increased their screening rate to 80% or better as well. So it, it showed what you can do when you bring people together in that coordinated fashion. In addition to the NCCRT, the American Cancer Society also supports epidemiologic research, like the research I just shared with you. And we have world-class epidemiologists who slice and dice all sorts of data uh, around cancer and screening and, uh, and help us recognize those trends. We also have um, an external research group that funds everything from bench to bedside. And we have a very active advocacy arm as well. Um, so my, my time is up, and I'll be happy to address <laughs> any questions once we get to that part of the program. But I yield now to my colleague, Dr. Rhodes. <laughs> So I'd like to thank um, Alden and Teresa for all of their work to put this uh, forum together and for inviting me um, to talk about something that I don't get to talk much about in my day job because now I uh, work more in community engagement and less on the side of health services research. So I'm going to go back to my health services research hat because I gained those skills um, through the fellowship and I see the fellowship continuing to provide opportunities for me to uh, continue to explore and to develop some solutions to the problems that I described during my fellowship. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanna start by saying this is sort of my new soapbox and it probably doesn't need to be said in this forum necessarily, but outside of these walls, this is and it, this idea that health disparities uh, are a population level problem is not really well crystallized. And the problem with that is twofold. The first is that if we look at it as an individual level problem, then we can take a sort of a deficit lens and say, well, we can blame the victim. These people lack education or lack access or lack trust in institutions. And on the provider side, we can spend countless hours, waste countless hours, arguing about whether or not a provider is racist or respectful. Um, and whenever I've said these things in national fora, I always have some provider come up and say, well, this is how I try to interact with you know, minority patients. And really, that's not the argument that we need to be having. The, the problem with keeping it in this kind of frame of an individual level problem mm -hmm. is that our solutions then look like they target individuals. So we're gonna educate the uneducated. So again, it kind of keeps us in this deficit frame. And for providers, we're going to um, train them in cultural competence. And what's really interesting to me is that the cultural competence guidebooks never include a chapter about white people. And so you're sort of saying by that, that white is normal and everything else needs to be learned. It's effectively an inequitable position that we start from trying to get to equity. And I'm not sure that that's possible. So the fact that the disparities that we see in California for certain racial and ethnic groups, we see across the country in those same racial and ethnic groups, makes me think that there's actually something bigger going on. It's not just an individual level problem. And I wanted to pick up on something, Dorado, that you mentioned, which is that you see uh, particularly at times when there are new interventions for diseases, there's a sharp decline for certain populations, but a, the same trajectory, no change in slope for other populations. And that can't possibly be something related to, for example, our genetics, um, you know, simply changed in the population. It has something to do with something that is systematically being delivered in a differential way. So what I'm showing you here are, um, these are two curves from a, an old paper I published that I really love so much um, because this was the first time that um, we were able to see on the left panel 
Kaplan-Meier curves uh, showing survival for white population that was actually lower than African-American population, uh, in, which is in the red line, and that's on the left side. And that's in California's largest integrated health system, and I'm sure you all know what it is. I'm, I don't think I need to say it, but you probably can figure it out. On the right panel, we're looking at patients who were treated outside of that system, and you see the, the uh, usual spread of what we can characterize as disparities by race ethnicity in terms of survival um, from colon cancer. The first time I saw this, these two Kaplan-Meier curves was actually sitting in a cafe with my statistician, and we had just been uh, gotten slapped down by JAMA because we had turned in a paper or submitted a paper where we wanted to really talk about why people go where they go to get their care. And effectively, what we were showing was segregation in California's hospitals without saying that. Um, and they sent it back and they said, well, if you've included people who are enrolled in California's largest integrated healthcare system, you we're not gonna read it. You have to take them out because they don't have a choice of where they get their care. So as we were disaggregating the, the Californians with colon cancer, my statistician just decided to run these curves because everything we were doing was really about disparity. So he's like, hey, let me look. And when he brought these curves to me, we were shocked. And we were like, if this is real, this is a really big deal. And we have to figure out why it looks this way. Because these lines in the, on the left side are all sort of piled on top of each other. And having worked in that system, I know that there are a lot of algorithms for care. There are certain things you can do, and there are certain things that you absolutely cannot do. Um, and so we decided to ask the question, is this effect a difference in receipt of National Comprehensive Cancer Network guideline care? So we looked across the population in this integrated health system, and we did indeed find that NCCN guideline care was adhered to across race, ethnicity, and even across the different types of insurance products that also exist in this system. So when we went back to, to you know, finalize and analyze the rest of the paper, which I have to say, we had to use really high level methods. We had to use propensity score matching, where we're actually able to match the patients on race, gender, stage of disease, age, um, uh, comorbidity score, uh, and, and like three socioeconomic factors, except the difference was where they got their care. And we found that this same finding held up very strongly. So when we sent it back in, we were asked, well, what about in the systems outside? What happens when you account for in your models whether or not the patients outside this system got evidence-based care? And when we did that, what we found was the disparities gaps closed in those settings as well. So just, a, I think, like a month later, and by random coincidence, we were writing a similar paper in acute myelogenous leukemia, and we found the same thing. And since then, I've reviewed a number of papers, including in ovarian cancer and other gynecological malignancies, where people look at comparison of receipt of evidence-based care and outcomes, and the disparities gaps close. So I know that there's a lot, a big emphasis, especially in, in this room and on this campus and, and with forward thinkers about the impact of the social determinants of health. And somehow we get a dichotomy between, well, it's the social determinants, it's not really care. And I just wanna point out two things. One is there's variation in care across different types of healthcare settings. And number two, as we found in the first paper we tried to write about segregation, the social determinants actually tell you where you can or cannot get care or drive that, that part of where people receive care. So even though care doesn't get as much credit, the social determinants are embedded in those numbers. So what I want to sort of drive home or emphasize is this idea that we need to uh, look at the social determinants and work to change policy, but we also need to look at the systems, and in particularly the systems of care where people have been segregated into them and that segregation has not gone away, um, and, and start to think about interventions that can happen actually at the point of care. Because some people are gonna get, as we just heard, some people are going to be diagnosed with colorectal cancer even if um, they screen appropriately. So this is just one slide from a project that I've been working on for the past year, and this is where the fellowship comes in again. So um, in collaboration with a former Harkness fellow, people familiar with the Harkness program, it's sort of the sister program to the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship, 
um, and most of the folks are from the UK. My collaborator was from Australia. I actually met him at UCSF. He was locked out of his office. Uh, I was a year out of my fellowship and he came and said, uh, you know, I'm locked out of my office. Can I sit in here? And as we started chatting, he told me he was a Harkness fellow. So we started about a decade long friendship. And he now works in the Australian, uh, in Victoria, Australia, in the Health and Human Services Agency. And what he does is he builds platforms that pull from their administrative data to report back to hospitals how they're doing in terms of certain types of outcomes. Right now he's working on hospital acquired conditions. He contacted me because he wanted to give this platform to the state of California. And so I said, okay, well, I'll get on the call with you. And they couldn't understand it, exactly what it was he was trying to do. And, but what they asked for was, can you give us a business case? Can you give us one disease that, where you can show that evidence-based care makes a difference? Because then we can think about how we distribute this back to the hospitals. So over the past year, we spent uh, a, a time building a platform that plugs right into the California Cancer Registry data. So what that allows us to do is grab not only the cancer data for every patient diagnosed with a non-melanomatous um, cancer in the state, but we also get the vital statistics data and we also get the uh, patient discharge abstract. So we can calculate comorbidity scores um, and we can uh, actually look at what kinds of care patients uh, received. Not only that, the cancer registry gives us the opportunity to look at whether or not patients refused care, because that's the other argument that we get when we talk about disparities, like, oh, yeah, you know, that's just patient choice. So we can actually look at that. And in colorectal cancer, there's only 2% of patients who refused, for example, chemotherapy. We still gave the hospitals credit for recommending that they get chemotherapy. So what we've done is build this platform that is going to be based on California data. So it's all sort of contained within the state, which means that we can distribute it back to the hospitals actually for free. And why does that matter? Well, because there's inequities amongst the resources that hospitals have. So a number of hospitals are involved in what's called the Commission on Cancer um, Quality Improvement uh, Program. It's the largest national cancer quality improvement program in the country. But it actually costs money. There's an upfront outlay of several thousands of dollars, and then you have to maintain a registry, staff, and data, and make sure that you're collecting data in a way that is, is certified by the COC. What that means is in California, only a third of the hospitals are involved in the COC program. And the two thirds that are not involved tend to be high Medicaid hospitals, which is where racial and ethnic minorities cluster for care. And so not only are they not able to track their data, but they're not able to actually intervene on it. And so right now what we've got is uh, a system that can deliver back to the hospitals in an anonymized way. Here's how you're doing on NCCN guidelines. Here's how you're doing on COC guidelines. Um, and we're starting with GI cancers. And then we're gonna compare you to the rest of the state. And you can't see who you're being compared to. You just know it's all the other hospitals. At the bottom of each page of each report, the hospitals have an opportunity, and, and I think this is uniquely not American. We're not highlighting the low performers. Instead, we're highlighting the positive outliers. And then we're giving the positive outliers an opportunity to tell everyone on this platform, how are you doing what you're doing? Um, and the reason it's important that it's anonymized is this kind of concept that I've sort of been thinking about a lot recently, which is, Low resource settings are often the most resourceful settings <laughs> because they've got to get things done with less. But what often happens is when we come from high resource settings, we look at the low resource setting and we say, oh, we're not going to do that because, oh, it comes from there and their patients are like this. And there's sort of an arrogance that goes with it. So when you anonymize it, you take all of that away and you just have the, the simple question, can we look at this intervention in absolute terms? Can we adapt it and adopt it to our setting? So where we are right now with this process is the platform is actually built. Um, and we've been talking to the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. They're very, very interested in disseminating it across the state. So we're now looking at the technical aspects of whether or not they have the, the staff and the technical expertise to keep the, um, to do all the ID management and the privacy and the logins and stuff and the troubleshooting with users. Um, so on the ground, we have the UC Cancer Consortium, which has five uh, national comprehensive or um, NCI cancer centers uh, across the state, and we're all networked into um, a, a network, a consortium, we're called. 
And so we've got four out of the five UC systems who have agreed to use this uh, platform. And then at UCSF, what they've done is they've actually guaranteed that four of our partnered hospitals, because you know big academic institutions are buying up other hospitals or putting their names on them. So four of the hospitals in our accountable care organization are now going to be effectively forced to use the platform. And the reason that UCSF was interested in doing that is because they know that what that is gonna mean is that those hospitals have to come together with UCSF and talk together about how patients uh, will not be lost or fall through the cracks because they've had one part of their care in our system and are going outside to have the rest of their care, for example. So I, I'm really excited about this because it's effectively um, doing what I call, what I call um, making the system eat itself. Because the hospitals are gonna get better reimbursement for um, higher adherence to evidence-based care and for better outcomes. I don't know that they care about disparities, but in doing and pursuing evidence-based care and higher rates of delivery of evidence-based care, they're gonna end up um, ha having a positive impact on disparities, whether they like it or not. <laughs> so the end. So good evening, everyone. I am um, extremely excited to be here amongst friends and peers um, and folks I follow on Twitter. Um, I, let me get my uh, slides up. If, if I were to take the time to thank everyone involved in um, this program, it would honestly take five minutes of my 15 minutes, so I'm not gonna do that, so no one be dinging me for my time. Um, but literally, I wanna thank all of the, the people involved in planning. Um, what you've heard today is that you know, colorectal cancer is a problem, right? Um, uh, and the burden of disease is not equally distributed, right? And so there's, if we look at geography, there's certain areas in the U.S. that are hot spots that have a higher mortality rate for colorectal cancer. If we look at race ethnicity, we've seen some of the, the rates and the incidence rates and mortality rates, we've discussed that. If we look at educational attainment, we see almost a dose-dependent relationship where those who have less education are more likely to die of colorectal cancer, and so on and so on. And so there's definitely some gaps in our knowledge base. We still have, we lack data in understanding, particularly sexual and gender minorities. Um, we don't have much data on that. We don't know what disparities lie there, but we can count that there's some disparities when we look at those populations. Um, we also know, and this was highlighted uh, in the talks as well, that there are certain groups that are more likely to underutilize care uh, or to not be recommended care. Um, and Dorado and Kim both, both highlighted that. Um, you know, and I, I would like to submit to you today that, um, like Kim said, it's a system level problem, but I also believe it's a both and. So it's a system level problem, but it's also an individual level problem. And I want to submit to you that regardless of what your, oh, thank you, regardless of where you practice, what kind of work you're engaged in, you can't afford not to be engaged in this work. Um, and that it's, a, it's, it's, it's going to take all of us to come to a solution. Um, uh, I think about, um, actually, as I was walking in, I had the pleasure of meeting the current fellows. And I was talking with one of the fellows, and she said, you know, it's so cool that uh, we have this discussion that there's subspecialists who are engaged, because often subspecialists either aren't at the table or they don't want to be at the table or just not there. And, and that's true. Oftentimes, particularly those of us in subspecialty medicine, we may not be at the table for where the decisions are made, policies are being recommended. And so for me, it's truly an honor, but also, I hope that through this talk, you also can see yourself in ways in which you can get engaged regardless of what you do as a profession or as an aspirational career. So one of the things that um, Kim just highlighted were the social determinants of health. And we know that those are the kind of structures that impact care, impact receipt of care, impact actions, recommendations, et cetera. And um, for those of us who are in clinical medicine, uh, sometimes we like to think that we influence largely the outcomes of those whom we see in our clinics or elsewhere in the kind of healthcare continuum. But the truth of the matter is the healthcare setting is only responsible about 10 to 20, depending on which paper you read, 10 to 20% of the health that people have. Um, and so it's largely those things outside of the walls of our clinics outside the walls of our hospitals that influence care. 
And so what I'd like to submit to you is that um, regardless of whether you're a clinician, scientist, uh, social worker, et cetera, and it, forgive me, I, if I went down the list of everybody's profession here, that would take another five minutes. Um, but it's important that we all be mindful of the social determinants of health and how that influences the care of our patients. Um, I, just to give you a little bit of, of background on myself and some of the work that, that we're doing at Ohio State. Um, so one of the things that, that you know, uh, Kim very eloquently highlighted is the Im impact of systems. So creating structures by which you can help people, and, and even Dr. McCleary, you highlighted how, in your example, and giving the Delaware experiment, how they created a system, even at a policy level, to help people navigate beyond, individuals navigate beyond barriers that they might have at the individual and community level to get screened and then obviously have their mortality and incidence rate impacted because of that. Um, the other thing that I think we all have to be engaged in is, you know, one of the things that I've been more thoughtful about uh, throughout my experience here in the fellowship and then even subsequently is, well, what's my role as a clinician in influencing housing? What's my role as a clinician or physician scientist in influencing education? What's my role as a physician in influencing structural racism uh, or implicit bias? And I think to ignore that is to uh, turn a blind eye to a problem that we can influence. You know, I think about um, our former president, President Obama, and, and one, of the, one of his famous quotes was, change will not come wait, wait for some other person or some other time. We're the ones we've been seeking. We're the change that we seek. And so, you know, you can't leave it to someone else to determine who's going, who's going to be the social worker to determine where this person gets housing. Why not be proactive in that? Um, a couple of things that we're doing at The Ohio State uh, that I'm actively involved in is um, one thing that, that I will lead is a healthy community center. So this is actually, we went to the community and we said, what kind of things do you need? And this is a disparate community, high infant mortality, high cancer, high hypertension, high diabetes. And we held these multiple um, fora. And we said, basically, what do you need? It's not, this is not a research study. This is actually just trying to figure out how we can better help you. So we're not coming in to just leave, do a research questionnaire, and then leave. And they said, we want information about how to lead healthier lives, how to eat healthier, food access is a problem, food deserts is a problem. Can you help us here? And so our, our health system purchased a building that was an old library, and we're turning it into a healthy community center where the focus is food access. So that's an example, and we'll have teaching kitchen, we'll have um, conference rooms, we'll have a local market where people can get free fresh produce, uh, partnering with the Mid-Ohio Food Bank. We'll have a local retailer who's selling vegan products uh, from there at below market rate. Um, but that's an example how, you know, I never would have thought being a student, being a resident, being a gastroenterology fellow, that a gastroenterologist would be leading an effort to actually have a healthy community center, right? That's not in the job description for a gastroenterologist, right? Um, so, you know, I want you to think about that. The other thing is, um, at our, we have a Center for Cancer Health Equity, and really our charge is to think about ways that we can um, not only inf kind of help change the trajectory of those who are engaged in cancer screening, those who are knowledgeable about cancer prevention, um, also increasing accrual in, in clinical trials. And so, you know, I don't have knowledge about every culture and every um, population that we have. We're, we're actually quite diverse. We have the second largest Somali population to Minnesota. We have a large Bhutanese population, large Nepali population. And so we actually, through our Center for Cancer Health Equity, have community health workers that help us in those communities. And that's helping us to change the face of those who are coming in for clinical trials. And why is that important? Well, you all know that um, um, it's hard for clinical trials to be generalizable if the people who are enrolled in the trial do not reflect the population, right? And so we're having all these novel breakthroughs, right? Novel breakthroughs in cancer therapies and um, immunotherapy but if you go to table one for most of the, the trials in the New England Journal, et cetera, et cetera, if you look at table one and you scroll down to, to black or Hispanic, certainly they're a minority in, in there. And so, you know, changing um, behaviors and changing structures to try to influence that is one of our goals as well. And um, what, what does that look like? So I, I think about that from different ways. And again, I, I'm trying to give you different perspectives so you can see yourself and what you can do where you are. So um, from an educator standpoint, 
If you're an educator, one thing that you may be able to do is to influence those, especially if you're in medical education, who are pursuing careers in cancer care. If we look at um, the, uh, the face of oncology, the face of oncology does not look like this room. Um, and so we need more oncologists, more uh, oncologists from diverse backgrounds. And why does that matter? Well, the data demonstrates that, um, unfortunately, physician concordance matters in outcomes. If uh, the data shows that if a patient looks like me, um, that patient is more likely to receive and act upon my recommendations, okay? The data also shows that if I am a black male with colorectal cancer or any kind of cancer and I um, go into uh, a white physician's office who is an oncologist, I am more, and this is evidence out of Wayne State from Terrence Albrecht's group, and I go in, my, my age can be the same as someone else with stage 3 colorectal cancer, uh, my background medical history can be the same, but they're less likely to bring up a clinical trial to me. They're more likely to use fewer words. They're more likely to try to dominate the conversation. And so that matters. So thinking about it from diff different perspective matters. And just like uh, Kim highlighted, this is, you know, as we, and you've probably seen this diagram multiple times, those of you who are in this, in this work, the upstream and kind of downstream uh, description. So many of us, those of us who are in, in clinical medicine, we like to think that we're having impacts, but really we're at the point of care after diagnosis or at the point of diagnosis, but we're not necessarily influencing, thank you, we're not necessarily influencing the upstream factors. And I would like to submit that if we're going to um, influence the upstream factors, we have to be engaged outside of what happens when we're wearing our white coat. And, um, one of the things that Dorado was hitting on, particularly as we think about influencing um, colorectal cancer development over time, is colorectal cancer prevention starts far, beyond, far before someone gets recommended to have a colonoscopy or a fecal occult blood test or a FIT test. It actually starts in childhood. And so what are we doing in our schools? I talked about educational attainment, but what are we doing in our schools to actually shift behavior? What are we doing to try to shift nutrition in our schools? And certainly, many of you are thinking, well, how can I do all of this? You don't necessarily have to do all of it, but being able to point someone in the direction to do it is, is influential. One of the things we also have at The Ohio State is we partner with Columbus City Schools. And we have what's called Health Science Academies, where it's a pipeline from elementary to high school um, that is a typically underperform or traditionally underperforming school system, uh, where no one wanted to send their kids there. And we started this Health Science Academy in which we put clinicians, so physicians, dentists, uh, allied health professionals in the classroom with teachers to deliver the curriculum um, and then monitor those kids over time. And we're, very, we're still very early, we're about five years in, so we don't have a lot of outcome data uh, yet. But it's influencing education pattern, their success with getting into college, and we like to think more productive citizens, but we also like to think that we're impacting their health in doing so. But that's, that'll be an outcome we find much later down the line. So as, as my time winds down, um, and I really look forward to the discussion piece of this, um, I want to leave you with a story. So I'm a dad. One of the things that, that wasn't mentioned in the introduction is I'm a father of three. I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old, and story time is a cherished time for us. Story time is a cherished time for me because it also means that they're going to bed soon. So that's, that's also a, a very exciting time for me. Um, but this is one of my favorite books. It's not one of their favorite books. It's my, one of my favorite books to read to them. Um, and it's called, What Do You Do With the Problem? And it tells the story of a young boy who one day recognizes he has a problem. The problem is captured, um, is picked, pictured or depicted as a cloud, a black cloud. And the more he tries to avoid this cloud, the larger the cloud becomes. He tries to hide behind things, he tries to run for it, and the larger and larger the cloud becomes. Until one day he decides he's going to turn towards the cloud and face that cloud. And he's, the book, it says, he discovered something beautiful about it. The, the cloud, the problem, contained an opportunity. And I submit that to you. You know, like I said, Obama said, you know, we can wait for some other person some other time. This problem won't go away until we face it. And it presents for all of us a great opportunity, whether you're in clinical medicine, whether you're in a physician scientist, a researcher, social worker, patient advocate, patient themselves, um, you have tremendous opportunity to make an impact. And the last story, and with the last probably two minutes I have left, um, there's a book uh, called Swimmy. Anybody ever read Swimmy? 
No. Swami tells a story of a fish. This is a black fish in a sea of, of um, goldfish. And Swami all, was swimming all across the, the ocean, and one day a big tuna came up and ate all of his family, right? So he's alone, and he's searching for um, another family, another family of goldfish. And he was different. You know, he was the black out of the, the goldfish. And one day he came across a school of a fish, and he said, look, guys, there's this big, scary tuna. There's this big, scary problem coming in, and we cannot beat this thing unless we come together. You know, one of the things that, that I see in academic medicine is we are so siloed. And I'll speak for, I'll speak for myself, because I know that doesn't, doesn't apply to anyone in this room or any health system represented here. Um, <laughs> but we are a large health system, and we, we have such a large university or a land-grant institution, one of the large land-grant institutions, and there could be someone working exactly on what I'm working on in the College of Social Work or at the law school, and I have absolutely no idea. We're working in such silos. If we're going to impact the trajectory of colorectal cancer amongst young adults, those less than 50 that Dorado was highlighting, those greater than 50, if we're going to influence screening rates, if we're going to influence our systems like Kim talked about, it's going to take all of us working together to do so. And certainly, we have all different roles to play in this. But I encourage you, when you leave here tonight, think about how you can interact with somebody across campus. Think about investigating what somebody at your institution is doing outside of your discipline to attack this problem. But think about what you can do outside of your white coat, outside of your role, uh, to influence the trajectory of colorectal cancer in the United States. Thanks. That was awesome. So I, I wanted to first, I, I'm sure there are a lot of questions um, and comments, and maybe just start off by asking a key question, which is all of this has to be um, resourced in some way, right? So Dr. Brooks, Dr. Gray, Dr. Rhodes all spoke about ways to attack this problem, ways to intervene that it, to me requires resources, whether it's national level resources from the ACS, research level resources uh, for Dr. Rose and Dr. Gray, your institute purchasing a building, that's amazing. But you know, how did you get to that point of getting the resources and marshalling those resources towards tackling this problem of uh, inequities in colorectal cancer? Well, I'll start. Um, American Cancer Society, as I said, we teamed up with Centers for Disease Control more than 20 years ago uh, to establish a National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Uh, so CDC brought some resources, American Cancer Society brought some resources. Over the years, those resources have actually dwindled as the organization has grown. One of the things that I'm actually most impressed about with regard to the 80% in 2018 campaign, not necessarily pleased, but impressed, is we had no money going into this campaign. We had no new allotment of dollars to put forth this national initiative. And yet, through the partnership with all of those 120 organizations, each of them reaching out to their constituents, through active involvement from the American Cancer Society. Fortunately, the American Cancer Society, um, just prior to beginning that initiative, we actually went through a reorganization and we created a veritable army of public health professionals working in communities, working with hospital systems, working with primary care systems, working with federally qualified health centers. And those folks really, they drank the Kool-Aid and they took that message out there. But it was really very much a, a hands-on, field level, organization to organization, community to community initiative and effort. So certainly big dollars are helpful, but there's a lot that you can do with a relatively small investment. I think that that's really important to keep in mind. <clears throat> One of the um, committees that, that uh, a subcommittee of the community advisory board that sits within my office um, is the Faith Communities Committee. And what I always say is you can't work with the Faith Committee if you don't have faith. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the work that I showed you has been funded through grants that have sort of popped up out of sort of happenstance. I mean, the, the platform was built 
um, on some of those end of the year funds that the California Department of Public Health said we got to get rid of some funds. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to close out our books. Yeah. But actually, what I what I want to highlight instead is the first the first health services research paper that I did that kind of led me on this path, which happened while I was a fellow here, and um, I remember. Um, wanting to get the California Cancer Registry data but not having any money and calling the California Cancer Registry and first explaining that I didn't have any money. So that, mm. was, the <laughs> that was the end of the first conversation. <laughs> and then in the second conversation, I, I spoke with, um, I remember coming into the office and Jean Raphael was uh, one of my classmates, one of my uh, co-fellows, and I said, I just want to get this data. And he was like, you should just call them again. So I picked up the phone and I said, I don't know if you remember me. I introduced myself and the guy said, oh yeah, I remember you, you're the one with no money. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but I'll give you the data. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of, not only the beginning of my use of this data, but it was actually the beginning of the California Cancer Registry beginning to distribute the data in a linked way with the discharge data and the vital statistics data that they hadn't done previously. So I, I feel like <clears throat> there aren't always going to be the right resources at the right time. Um, but I think if you believe in the thing that you're working on, you're going to open yourself to stumble into the right people mm -hmm. um, or people who have resources or interest um, who are going to help you along that path. And, and I think, too, as I, as I think mm -hmm. about um, our, our work around the PACE program, uh, which is kind of a grassroots effort, um, it started with an idea, and I remember a class that I took here, a leadership class I took as a part of the fellowship. I'm not sure if it was Alden's lecture, but they were highlighting the work of a leadership guru, John Cotter, who um, was talking about you know, pearls for leadership, and one is being able to create a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember when I first started Ohio State, I went with this idea of the, the PACE program, and the idea being that we wanted to be able to offer free screenings to those who are uninsured or underinsured, and then be able to see it through if, if we identify the cancer, be able to get that person treated, et cetera, without them having a financial burden of it. And it, it, it seemed like unrealistic, um, but going into it with my faculty, my peers, nurses, and then leadership of the hospital with that sense of urgency and a plan, return of you know, some return on investment, like you were talking about earlier, information, we made it happen. And so really, um, it was, it's an initiative that was born out of no money, just me, co you know, cold calling or approaching my colleagues and saying, hey, every Saturday, it started every Saturday in March. Every Saturday in March was Colorectal to Cancer Awareness Month. I want to have these free screenings. Will you donate your time? Meaning we had to waive professional fees. I had to call pathology. Mm -hmm. Will you donate your time to run these specimens, these polyps that we find? Uh, had to go to leadership. If we find a cancer, can you get this person treated? And mm -hmm. literally all these were just calls, you know, cold calls. Called Walgreens, Walgreens, look, this is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Can you donate prep? Yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was, you know, certainly there were no's, but I kept calling until I got a yes from someone. Right. Um, and it was, you know, just trying to figure out ways to make it happen without having money. Um, and so certainly that has been a benefit. And then I think, too, you know, you all are in different stages of your career, um, but just being, advoca you know, being good advocates, learning how to be good advocates for what you believe in. Um, and I think I've just been blessed to be an opportunity in a setting in which I have the opportunities to influence some decisions. Um, and I think it's been just a lot of opportunity. Like, for example, Ohio State, one of our strategic plans that came out about a year or two ago was around healthy communities. And so the focus is healthy communities. So I try to pitch myself or put mm -hmm. myself in position to be an influencer in that space mm -hmm. and trying to talk to the right people. So you all have that same ability. Um, and there's nothing special about me um, besides that I've just taken advantage of opportunities that have been present. Um, and, and so s similar to that buying that building, you know, they were going to buy the building regardless, but right. I was in a position to influence how that building was used. So, Spectacular. I want to open it up to questions about the resourcefulness, the creativity, the persistence that you're hearing here. Yes. And you don't know, I want to give you a group hug. I, I want to do that. 
Um, but I, what I want to say is that my initiative this year was to be a citizen psychologist, and all of you are citizen physicians. Mm. And I, I, I wish you would involve psychologists in some of this work, because when, I, when the idea was created, people said, where did it come from? A woman of faith, and I said, it came from a higher authority, and let's just move with it. Uh, mm. But it's just been so fascinating to hear you talk, because you are the physician side of what I created in the psychology side that was already existing. And so now there'll be awards at the state level and at the division levels for all these people doing these wonderful things. So I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for affirmation that people do good things, not because it's them, but because right. of their caring for other people. And I'm hoping at some point you will involve psychologists who can collect data around the different patterns of people accepted who may all be demographically appearing the same, but there are different kinds of things that are going on that you could pinpoint how you need to address that. So hats off to all three of you. You're just wonderful. A group hug to you. <laughs> Another question, yes. Okay, thanks. So this is going to be probably a complicated question, but thank you all for your remarks. And you know that you all sort of said a little bit opposing yes, but comments. You know, Dr. Rhodes said it's really um, a community and population health issue. And um, Dr. Gray said, well, we still need to work on the social determinants of health. So I'm going to paint the picture here. So I don't know about all of Boston, but in the partners' hospitals, we have really intense population health management. And all doc you know, primary care doctors are incentivized and care about getting to all of our quality metrics. And in addition, we have 98% insurance coverage here in Massachusetts and close to 100% for African Americans. But the head of quality at Partners shared the data up by race of our colorectal screening rates and we do have a difference by race between whites and, and blacks. It's probably only about a 10% difference, maybe, I, I don't remember exactly, 10 to 15% difference, but there's still a difference and I still find as a PCP here that when I ask black patients about getting screened, most of them say yes, but some of them have social determinants of health that make it hard. They can't take time off from work in some cases and will get penalized or in some cases have no transportation and have no way to get home, which you know is a requirement. So there are both sides of it and I guess I wonder what sort of strategies you can think of that would make us look more like that integrated system in California um, who will remain unnamed. But also, <laughs> maybe those patients are more like each other than our patients which go from the very, very poor and insured to the very wealthy. And it still is harder to get the very, very poor screened even when all the, the things are there that might make it possible from the healthcare side of things. Yes, that was complicated. Um, I, I, I think, you know, and, and I'll hit it from a complicated angle. I think um, one of the things that our system is trying to work on, because we are not as developed as an integrated system like the one that shall be unnamed, um, but we have an accountable care organization where there are metrics. We have separate metrics for our medical system. And um, so trying to align those is one avenue to take. Um, that will allow us to identify those in highest need. I think the other thing too is that our system has recognized the importance of identifying, collecting information on social determinants of health and we're very much in our infancy in that. But being able to see those people, when I say see, not literally see them in the clinic, be able to identify what their problem is, um, I shouldn't even say it as a problem, but what their barrier is to receipt of care or in this case colorectal cancer screening um, is huge. And then not only being able to identify but then to act upon it. Um, I think you also speak to a larger issue. So you mentioned, you know, as a, as a primary care physician, people are, may not be apt to um, receive your recommendation for screening. Additionally, there's still primary care providers who aren't recommending it, period. And that's the number one predictor that someone will get screened is that their primary care provider recommends it. So I think trying to set uniform standards, that's something our, our system is trying to do too because we also have primary care um, networks like CPC Plus, et cetera, that um, they are reimbursed for. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's huge. So I think trying to tackle it from, from different uh, ways. The other problem that's much harder to, to address, I think, even taking it more to an individual level is, you know, if Adjua, one of our current fellows, a guest, uh, she's a guest, former gastroenterology fellow, now one of the Commonwealth fellows, um, if she sees a patient, she's going to have 15 minutes for a return probably or 30 minutes for a new. And um, sometimes, at least the argument is that that's not enough time to address these social determinants of health or other things that happen outside of the acute um, the visit for which they're seeing you. So that's part of the problem, too. So it's, it's a system-level problem. It's an individual-level problem with some providers not recommended for whatever the issue is, if it's implicit bias. And then it's an integrated delivery problem, too, if the system does not allow for um, tracking of appropriate data, sending out like that system. They send out fit cards. So they, they literally mail it out. Currently, I don't have the capacity to do that in my, in my health system. They don't mail out just automatically when you turn 50, they don't mail them out to people. So it's dependent upon the providers to place the order. So um, there's, there's opportunity, I think, at all phases of this. Yeah, yeah I, I, <clears throat> I want to echo that. Um, my purpose in, in advancing this idea that the social determinants then feed into what kind of care you end up getting is just to make the point that we spend a lot of time um, and I think it's appropriately spent because it was not, the attention wasn't there before on the social determinants. But what I, what I also sort of want to do is not neglect the systems of care who can take responsibility and where there are opportunities to lever power, which is effectively around reimbursement and money. Mm -hmm. um, because people, um, what I, the, the first paper that I did while I was in the fellowship, I used to say it was about high Medicaid hospitals. And people would get offended. Like I was saying, well, the high Medicaid hospital doctors are like somehow like worse doctors. And what I was really saying was high Medicaid hospital doctors do the best they can with what they have, but their resources may not be enough specifically for cancer care. And so that really kind of got me understanding this concept of, you know, you practice as your setting tells you to practice. I mean, I was trained a certain way at UCSF when I joined the faculty at Stanford. I started doing stuff that I was like, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I don't remember learning this. <laughs> um, and it's just because of the cultures that are there. So what I'm really trying to advance is not to ignore the social determinants, but rather to also um, not ignore the place where we actually can make a change around equity, where we can sort of move and drive um, the way care is delivered. And what that really means is actually changing the culture. I mean, that's what this integrated health system as I said, I, you know, through my training, I actually work there, and I know that there are certain things you can do and there are certain things you can't do. And so what you're really balancing in that setting is if you take 100 patients and you uh, uh, provide appropriate care based on stage and other things, you're going to get a bell-shaped curve, right? So 97.5% of them are going to do pretty good or great, and 2.5% are not going to do that well. And that 2.5%, if that's your family member, you want them to get personalized care, not population health. And that I think that's a, a point of tension that we're going to come to. But the reason that they get the outcomes they get is because they just like go, OK, whatever, you're doing this. And it's not precision medicine. When you look at systems that have a lot of variation, you get a lot of variation in outcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Partners Healthcare, which is Mass General Hospital and the Brigham and Women's, most people are insured, and we are highly incentivized to do our very best to recommend screening for every single patient, and doctors are bonused on doing it. And again, most people are insured, but still not everyone's getting screened. So I do think that there is a window for something else. So for example, what, what Dr. Gray said, even if I have a half hour for a follow-up visit, I have to spend a lot of time convincing some black patients to get screened. Some of my colleagues may not have the same level of trust, nor the same motivation to spend 10 minutes convincing one person to get screened. So maybe a com community intervention where they see black doctors who care whether they get screened might make us get that 10% higher. So it seems like there may still be some personal factors that might make well, a difference. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, 
think one of the challenges, and I don't know how Partners handles this, is our tendency to put responsibility on the physician for everything. And I will say, and I'm just going to say it, Kaiser, Kaiser, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Kaiser of Northern California two decades ago decided colorectal cancer screening was important, and they have systematized it in a way that is admirable and that we would love to see replicated everywhere because everybody takes that seriously. Everybody knows they have some responsibility. The person who checks them in at the front desk, the, when you go to the eye clinic, you go see the eye doctor at Kaiser, they've got signs asking, have you had your colorectal screening? Or they'll <laughs> look in your medical mm -hmm. record to mm -hmm. see. And if not, the eye doctor will make a referral for you. Um, but they also, as Daryl said, they mail out fit kits. Well, just the whole idea of using stool testing, because they started off as flex sig and colonoscopy, and that was it, and they just hit a ceiling. So offering options. They have looked at this and worked and invested, and they, they are probably the best system in the world at doing this because they took it seriously, and everybody has a role to play in making it happen. And I just, I, I just wanted to add that the problem that you're talking about, I think, is so you do the system piece, and then you find, okay, what are the little, where are the fine tuning that we can do? Um, and my innovation, this is another of my new lines, my innovation is to actually insert more people into the care process rather mm -hmm. than inserting more yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking today about sort of this clinical trials problem, and if you think about it from an operational perspective, it's like, well, yeah, I'd like to invite you to a clinical trial, but it'll take me 30 minutes to describe to you what the trial is before we get to your questions. So what needs to happen is there needs to be an extra clinic room that's empty that is just for that. And there's a person that sits in that clinic room whose job it is to just do that, right? So for the 10 minutes that somebody doesn't want to spend convincing somebody to get screened, there's a room where, you know, people get convinced. And I'm not saying that healthcare systems are um, rushing to insert more people, but I think if folks are willing to, and this is where you get to, like, get outside your silo and you get your health economics people to help you actually run some Markov models and estimate how much money would they save if you did whatever it is that you're doing, it probably costs less to hire a person who sits in that one clinic room to make that happen. So that, I think that's the fine-tuning piece. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Encia Fisher. I have a pretty long title. So um, me and my supervisor, Sanju, we are here from the, oh God, sorry, I'm kind of loud. Um, I work for the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, and my title is Cancer Screening Patient Navigator Care Coordinator. And basically, I do what you just suggested. I am that buffer between the physicians and the people where I go out into the community, specifically the homeless and substance addicted community, and I rally for them to get cancer screenings. The three cancer screenings that I am in charge of trying to sign people up for are for colonoscopies, um, mammograms and also pap smears and the lowest numbers and me and my supervisor were just talking the lowest numbers that we have for screenings are for colonoscopies and because I am in the trenches and I mean literally and I hate to use this um, at my job we like to say recovery uh, mile but it is known as methadone mile I am literally in the trenches trying to get people that are on methadone mile signed up for these screenings so I do really truly um, have more of a comment than a question and I'm saying this to say a lot of the times when I deal with clients, and the majority of the clients that I deal with are actually Caucasian, um, and then minorities kind of come afterwards. But one thing I notice when I deal with minorities, specifically African Americans, Caribbean Americans, um, and also descendants who's, or people who speak Spanish, and I will say this, people of the Muslim faith, the number one kind of resistance I get from them is the manner in which the test is conducted, mm -hmm. because there's a stigma around unfortunately having a test that is going to be a set of an anal probe that is the number one thing and I just wanted to point that out to people because especially with the Muslim faith population they are totally against it and the problem is we do advocate for people to do fit tests but a lot of them don't qualify for fit tests because there was a pre-existing history whatever that may be um, sometime it could be um, I've had clients that will say to me well I don't want to do a colonoscopy I want to do a fit test I go and look at their records and they don't qualify for it because they had some type of determinant that excluded them from that. And because of that, 
they no longer want to do the colonoscopy. So we stay, I stay on top of the clients, but I don't forcefully do it because one thing I noticed with the population we work with, when it comes to healthcare, because of the addictions that, the issues that they have with substance abuse, it takes a back seat to their health. And most of the times when they come and seek my assistance, it's usually when they're in some sort of pain that is unbearable. And um, I'm just saying that to say that um, the, I would love if you, your organization, any of the doctors here, anybody here, because we do love having people come and do come speaking engagements and just coming to the center and really seeing what we do there. Because as you said, I am that buffer. My only job is to sign people up to get those cancer screenings and it also frees up the MDs. That frees up the RNs and the NPs, you know, because their job is already tough. So I'm able to, and I'm literally in the shelters every week. And it takes a while, especially with colonoscopies. Um, with the population that we serve, I noticed that it's all about trust. And regardless of the skin color, whether it's black, white, green, they have to see you enough to be able to trust you to open up to you. So I've had to learn how to be very savvy because I have people approach me that are highly inebriated. And so giving them information under those conditions sometimes is just saying, hi, my name is Incia, here's my card, and just I'll follow up with you another day. This is what I do, and I leave it at that. Um, so I was just, I wanted to just kind of touch on that because I noticed sometimes the homeless population, even though we talk about minorities, we don't necessarily include the homeless population who's one of the biggest minorities within that and um it's 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 really deserving work here and i did notice that our like i said when we said the cancer screenings the one that falls in comparison to every other one is the colonoscopies and a lot of it is stigma related and you would be so surprised that how many african-american men tell me I'm not going to, you know, and it's, the language is very explicit. And they tell me, I'm not doing it. No, I wasn't raised. I'm not no this. I'm not that. And that's why I say um, sometimes it's just more or less so just kind of building a relationship and just talking to people and making them understand. And I tell them this all the time. You know, two things you don't want to witness is a person dying from cancer. And I tell them, eat some from the inside out. And I try to kind of be a little graphic. But like I said, once again, I fine tune what I do to the person that I'm speaking with at the time. But, um, you know, I'm here and I think, you know, the position that I have is so integral because, like I said, I'm just there to focus on the things that you guys may not be able to necessarily do within your 30 or 15 minute appointment where mm -hmm. I can follow up with, sometimes I'm following up with patients two months in a row, and by the third month, I convinced them to get a colonoscopy. So, you know, it is very integral. My background is criminal justice social work. So it is very integral that you do have somebody that can take the time because sometimes it's not about giving the information, it's about building that relationship. And we also, one of the biggest things that we do is we eliminate barriers to getting the screenings. That's bus passes, even giving them a meal, even just giving them information, letting them know. And I'm actually, um, and I'll end it with this, I do go and do a lot of advocacy when I take patients for these appointments because a lot of our patients are homeless. And when I notice the difference in the disparity in how they're treated when they go to these healthcare providers as opposed to how I'm treated because I have paid insurance. And I do go to appointments with patients because I've had patients come back and say to me, I'll schedule them for the appointment and I'll say, do you want me to accompany you? No, I'm fine, I can get there. They'll call me back. Can you reschedule this appointment and accompany me because they are literally, because they know I'm homeless or they feel like I'm homeless, they're treating me a certain way. Mm -hmm. And when I go in there, things get done right away. So advocacy, 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 and just being empathetic and having the knowledge and know-how is really critical for getting these cancer screenings, specifically with the colorectal cancer, cancer. And I just wanted to say, I think, and I hate to say this categorically, if you have to break it down between religion and race, you have to understand each religion and each race, why there are those social determinants for them not to get these screenings and then try to kind of be that buffer and make them understand that getting the screening, and most of the time the clients that I have, they're so scared, and then when they get the screening, they don't have to go back for 10 years. <laughs> and that's the best part. And, but then when there's a follow-up, that's when having good skills come into play, because sometimes it's hard to get clients going back to get the follow-ups if they found something. So I just wanted to say that, and I'm here afterwards if anybody wants to exchange cards and information and come and visit the center, because I really say this in the city, this, what we do in the center that I represent is really integral to healthcare period, mental and physical health. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm George Molina, I'm a fellow in surgical oncology. I train in general surgery at MGH, I'm doing my fellowship 
uh, Dana Farber, Brigham and MGH, and uh, thank you for this great talk. I, I, I'm also, I've been thinking about this issue of um, fragmentation of cancer care. Mm -hmm. My particular focus is uh, liver and pancreatic cancer. Um, and I think one of the themes that really uh, struck me during the three talks was um, how do we get to a, a more integrated healthcare system? Um, and one of the things that I saw, I went to medical school here. I did my third year rotations at MGH. I, I've been living in this area now for about 15 years. And there was a, there's a huge discrepancy of the patients that we treated at Mass General, at the Brigham or Dana Farber. And those patients are, are predominantly white, well off patients. Um, and so we're not seeing, uh, you know, we have, uh, and I love partners in MGH and Brigham, Dana Farber, but we, and, and I believe we provide excellent care, but we, our system is very limited. We, you know, we don't have patients coming from the homeless, uh, you know, center work because they go to BMC. Um, so, and we don't have an integrated healthcare system in Boston. We have a partner system, a BI system a BMC system and a tough system, and they don't talk. I would see patients that had a certain cancer which could not come to MGH from North Shore, which is a partner's MGH affiliated hospital. So my question is how do we create more integrated healthcare systems that cross boundaries, uh, the boundaries that we have formed by hospital systems? Um, and I'm, in, I'm interviewing for jobs, and it's funny because I just interviewed for a Kaiser job. <laughs> and um, and I, I had no idea of Kaiser. I, I actually want an academic job. I've been, I've been raised in academia. I, I, do, I do research. I publish. My mentors are all, you know, nationally renowned. And I, I even feared saying Kaiser in front of them because, you know, it's a private, you know, what is it? But I was, I was just, I was just uh, uh, blown by, by their talk. And this, their healthcare system is literally an entire region of California. And we don't have that here. So how do we get to that? Because an uh, integrated healthcare system can worry about housing, can worry about food, can worry about safety. Um, in, and how can we get them the next 20, 30 years? Is it Medicare for all? Is it, you know, what is it? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll take that one. Um, and I just, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm neither, you know, I'm glomaring here on Kaiser. I'm not neither, you know, confirm nor deny. It's great. But what I would say is, what I would say about your hesitancy around it not being academic is that because it is a contained system, they have, um, I won't use any expletives, but they got a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opportunities for research, and you actually have to be Kaiser affiliated in order to get access to that data. They guard it very closely, but it is, it is primo data. Um, so in terms of how can we create these systems, what I would, what I would, I, I'm not sure, because what we're up against is the issue of market share. Like that's why you've got partners, and then you've got all these, like they're affiliates, but they don't work together. It's actually because they formed partners in order to negotiate insurance contracts. So they could get good reimbursement rates for all of the hospitals, but it doesn't mean that they're all sharing with each other. Mm -hmm. it's, it was just a negotiating strategy. The, for cancer care, the Affordable Care Act actually had built within it a few different strategies for reimbursement for hospitals, and one was accountable care organizations. And, that's why, and then the other one was bundled payments, which is turning out to not, not work so well. <laughs> but um, the accountable care organizations were the path forward. Now it's kind of in question what's going to happen with the ACA. Right. Um, and the other, the other part of that is all that the accountable care organization description said was about size. And so what you would see is a number of different practices jamming together so that they have a big size and that they can claim, because you're supposed to claim a population that you're taking care of. So you're, you're big enough, but um, John Ianni and I think wrote a paper a, a while back where what they found was that there were more differences inside of an accountable care organization than if you compared one accountable care organization to the other. And it's because you smashed together a bunch of practices but didn't actually put any um, uh, administrative sort of thought into how do we practice together in a streamlined way. And Kaiser really is the model right now for how to do that. And what, what I think healthcare systems need to look at is that not only is Kaiser doing that, but they're making money doing it because it's efficient. And they're, to just kind of put an exclamation point behind that, 
their community benefits budget is 1B with a billion dollars, mm -hmm. which means they have that much uh, ex revenue over expenditures that they can spend on other things, like big campaigns that keep people thinking about, how can I be healthy? How can I get outside? Should I eat more blueberries? Um, <laughs> so you're, you're right, that's the direction we need to go. I would recommend that you, um, if you're interested in kind of moving that agenda, either partner yourself up with some MBA type people and also some health policy and healthcare administration people because they're the ones who are gonna understand the structures that have to come together and what you could contribute is actually how to streamline the care because that's the piece that's often missing as we work in silos. Um, and then I would just say that in California, you know, Sutter is our second largest kind of, kind of integrated, system, integrated system that is trying to move toward a Kaiser model. So if payment streams and reimbursement do start to focus on accountable care organizations, you will see places try to get themselves more integrated. But short of that, you're not going to see it because healthcare is a business. And so you have to think about, you know, who's paying for what and, you know, whatever intervention that you design, hopefully you're reducing the cost for someone and that's who you go to to sell your intervention. There's a question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Mia Chandler. I'm one of the Commonwealth Fund Fellows this year. And I had a question um, out of curiosity for you. And it was sparked by uh, what our, our collaborator here in, in, the, in the March for Equitable Progress in Healthcare mentioned. She talked about a lot of these cultural factors um, as barriers. Um, but where my mind went was thinking about some of the technology that I've read about that may still be in its nascent form with respect to colorectal um, screenings. I wanted to know if either of you had any insight on how that's progressed and where it is. So I, what I'm specifically referring to is having read about pill-sized devices. And you may have spoken about that already when I was in class, but pill-sized devices that can be uh, fed to the gastroenterologist. Um, and I imagine that could even progress to the robotics of snipping a, a, a biopsy. So where are we in that? Um, and who's funding that research for people who are in that field? Um, uh, well, there, there, there is actually what's called a pill cam mm -hmm. that is used, and it has a really currently very narrow indication for colorectal cancer screening. Um, it is, I, I don't know that there's any research being funded on it other than by the company that makes it, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was initially designed for use in the small bowel because there's no way to get an endoscope in there. So for the small bowel, it works pretty well. For the colon, not so much because the colon is, you know, by usually a pretty dirty organ, and mm -hmm. you don't get a lot of nice, clear pictures. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's why we do the prep with colonoscopy, so you mm -hmm. get those really clear pictures. Um, the PillCam technology is improving, but I don't know that anyone recommends it as a first, second, or even third line yeah. colorectal cancer screening tool right now. Yeah. Um, there are other technologies, I mean, I, I think I alluded to virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography, which is a radiographic study, which has totally replete, replaced barium enema. Um, but that also requires a prep. It doesn't mm -hmm. require insertion of a, a scope all the way through the colon, and it might be something that might be acceptable to some of your patients if it, it were available. And that's, that's actually, I think, pretty well proven technology and useful. Uh, but it, in any of the other non-colonoscopy technologies, again, the final issue is if something abnormal is found, you've got to undergo the colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, it, as you're thinking about technologies, I encourage you to, you know, one very big movement is um, artificial intelligence or deep learning or machine learning, however you would like to describe it. Um, and certainly... Um, one of the leaders in that area is in the field of gastroenterology in that space. So um, one of the concerns that I, I was in a forum where um, they were talking about this amongst different leaders in artificial intelligence, and what's not clear is the disparities that might emerge as a result of its uptake. 
So if we think to, and I'll take you back to your sociology lesson of the fundamental cause hypothesis, and you think about as new technologies or new innovations are coming up, who is most likely to benefit from them, hmm. right? It's not going to be the underserved. It's not going to be the uninsured. It's not going to be the poor. Um, it's going to be people who have the money to afford it. Um, and so, you know, certainly I expect that, and, and there's different uses for artificial intelligence and deep learning, but those of you who are in that space where you intersect with, and this is going back to what I was talking about earlier, think about your intersectionality with other specialties on your campus, if you're in academic medicine or um, your business partners, you, those who are in computer technology, because they need you in the room, too, to think thoughtfully about how these um, technologies are going to be uptaked. Um, so, yeah, but look into artificial intelligence in this space. Well, actually, one other new technology that I was remiss in not mentioning is there is actually a blood test that is available for colorectal cancer screening. It doesn't perform exceptionally well right now, but it's approved by the FDA mm -hmm. for patients who refuse all of the kinds of screening. How they mm -hmm. document that, I don't know. Its uptake, again, has been very poor, but I think that that's really just step one, and we are... I, I really believe in the next five years or so that we're going to have a blood test that is potentially an effective screening tool. And that mm -hmm. ju that changes things dramatically, but we still come back to if you have abnormal mm -hmm. findings on that blood test, you yeah. got to go Don't see Carol. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the colonoscopy, I think, for the foreseeable future is going to be kind of our, our bottleneck with regard to yeah. really providing the, the full mm -hmm. range of equitable care to folks. I got a question. Um, my name is William, by the way. Uh, since moved from being a pre-med to a first-year medical student on the bottom of the totem pole. Um, so, you're there, you're there. <laughs> that's what it is. Um, I have one question. I'm sure, like my peers back here, probably have the same thing. So, um, a lot of the conversations that, that are being had are pretty high level. And just as starting first-year medical students um, and seeing what we're learning in class, particularly like the newer technologies, how can, do you have any insights into like how we can think about these things and how we can integrate what we learn in the classroom to actually thinking about it more on like a systems level and how to integrate that in the future when we're actually physicians and practicing? Like what are the things we should be thinking about now and doing to make sure these problems are solved? Thank you. Um, great point. Thank you for that question. Um, I am... In full transparency, I'm not familiar with the curriculum here, um, so I may say some things that you are already doing. Um, but if not, I would encourage you or your peers to champion development of curriculum that highlights such things. Um, so one of the things that we heard from our students at OSU is, um, hey, we want more exposure to understanding health disparities, how to address them, what health equity means, how we can be more engaged as a student body. and so. One of my peers came to me and said, hey, do you think you could lead such a course? Um, so I'm in the process of developing that for this, this spring course. So um, your voice matters. I say that because your voice matters, and change happens because of that. Um, I think you know, you've heard um, Kim also mention um, research that she does. As a medical student, I encourage you to get engaged in research. Even if you have no inkling of being involved in research as a career aspiration, and because it helps you to think critically about situations, about um, circumstances that you may not have thought about before, whether it be what we're talking about social determinants of health or even at the basic science lab. Um, and so getting engaged in research with people who here I know are doing fantastic work in this space who can help you to be an influencer um, on these issues. So. Uh, so I would echo the idea that you have the power right now, and it's because you're paying tuition. <laughs> Once you're being paid, <laughs> yeah, you want that too bad. Um, for myself, I I um, I took a health policy course. It was actually required as part of my medical school curriculum, um, but I held out for that program. I was on the wait list because I wanted to take health policy. Why I knew that, I don't know. Um, but what I would, I guess, what I would say, and I don't know how tight the curriculum is, especially in the first year. I mean, it's probably no time for anything, but. Um, Try to take a look around, and in particular, I don't know how you're affiliated with, with Dr. Reed's office, but be looking for those opportunities to get outside of just this sort of medical school curriculum. 
because where the action is, for example, one of the things that I ended up doing is I went and worked for um, a community-based organization uh, that was focused on African-American women's health. And so then I ended up meeting all these other people who were doing things outside of medicine. So I feel like the, everything that you said, I'm like, I would be over there trying to find out how can I get involved, even if it's just a couple of hours or an hour a week. Um, because that's where you're gonna start meeting people who are gonna lead you to other people, who are gonna lead you to some questions that will be unique because they're based on that sort of ripple effect of meeting people outside of this uh, narrow focus and scope of what is the first couple years of medical school. Yeah, actually I was gonna um, make the same point about trying to look, at, look out in the community and see where there are organizations that you may have a, a personal interest where you would want to invest some time um, in interacting with folks that outside of the medical environment I think is very helpful within the medical environment again I don't I don't know how much focus is placed on this uh, here at Harvard when I went to medical school we had an epidemiology class that was one you know one hour a week for I don't know six weeks or something and so, you know, you just learned as much as you needed to and then moved on. It wasn't actually until I, and I practiced medicine for 15 years. Then when I came back and did my fellowship and took a real epidemiology class, I recognized how much I did not know <laughs> and how, how much good information there is. And, 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 and also learning how to really read a, a medical article, a journal article, <coughs> because it's easy just to kind of gloss over, you know, and look at the, abstract and look at the results and the conclusion, you need to turn to table one like Daryl <laughs> talked right. about. And what, Does this even apply to the population that I serve or I want to serve? Um, so those are a couple of things that, that come immediately to mind for me. Well, one of the things I would add about getting out into the community now, and this is something that I experienced in um, working with the Bay Area Black Women's Health Project, is that they accepted me as a layperson and, and once you cross that threshold of like you're a doctor and now you're attached to some institution, that level of acceptance and opening doors and telling you the secrets and showing you where they think the problems are kind of shuts down, like the interaction changes. And I feel like that was a real benefit to the rest of my career and sort of how I think about how care is delivered and how I think about um, how I, a, as an individual, m I myself interact in that setting was very influenced by the experience working in the community and seeing how the community was perceiving the institution. I think that was a perfect question to end our forum, really looking towards the future. I know there are many other questions, questions, so we're going to maybe ask your question if we can. Question, okay. <laughs> okay, I, I think this will be relatively short. Uh, first of all, again, thank you, panel. Uh, my name is Mark Kennedy. I'm with the Boston Public Health Commission. Uh, this question uh, is for Dr. Brooks specifically, and I certainly would welcome any other comments. When you started your uh, comments, you talked about the issue of age. You talked about diagnosis um, in a population younger than age 50, which is why, of course, ACS lowered the age to 45. You mentioned when you were saying that that there were some concerns from some other whether they were guidelines institutions or individuals of prominence, whatever have you. I'd like to know what some of those concerns are or were. And then the other question I'd like to ask is this. If I am younger than the guideline age for a colonoscopy and I take a stool test that has a positive result, if there's blood found in my stool mm -hmm. and I have insurance, can I get a colonoscopy as a follow-up? I'll, I'll answer the second question, uh, second question first. And the answer in most cases is going to be yes, because even though uh, many insurers may limit screening colonoscopy to people over the age of 50, diagnostic colonoscopy is a whole different deal. So you may end up with a copay or deductible, which you wouldn't for a screening test, but the bulk of the cost for that colonoscopy should be paid for if you have a positive stool test finding, because it's now not screening anymore, it's a diagnostic study. With regard to uh, the, the pushback we got regarding changing the guidelines, I, there are some valid concerns. I mean, the, the numbers overall are still relatively small of people who are diagnosed before the age of 50, so 
you're talking about doing a lot of screening and, and potentially a lot of colonoscopies to find a smaller number of cancers. We ran the numbers, and from our perspective, it made sense anyway. Um, there also was concern about uh, whether we are shifting resources, and one of the big issues of concern, and Daryl alluded to it earlier, is that are we suddenly going to have all the, you know, the 45-year-old, kale-eating, uh, bicycle-riding, white women coming to get colonoscopies when their risk is still very, very low. And meanwhile, for minorities, the, there's not going to be any shift or for those people who are at higher risk. So are we going to be uh, potentially even diverting some resources? Because there are some places where colonoscopies are relatively limited resources. Are we going to make it harder for people who really need to get screened? Overall, across the U.S., there's excess capacity of colonoscopy, quite frankly. But it's um, not and and it's it's, not no, it's poorly it's it's poorly distributed. Um, um, but the other thing is, our guidelines don't say everybody go get a colonoscopy. We say get screened. So it comes back to you know that that stool test question. Um, that, but there are concerns just about the the resource costs for the nation. Are we spending uh, too much additional money without bang for that buck? Uh, so again, a lot of, of reasonable questions raised, but questions for which we felt we had looked at the data and we believe that moving to 45 is, is the right thing to do. And he didn't say it, but he's largely talking about the gastroenterologist community. So <laughs> uh, I was there at a meeting when he bravely stu stood up in front of our, in one of our largest annual meetings and, and made those comments, so I applaud him for doing that. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I will say though, it's primarily the academic gastroenterologists. Actually, mm -hmm. the rank and file. When I go out yeah. and speak in communities across the country, the rank and file gastroenterologists, for the most part, are very supportive because they're seeing these people at, you know, not just forty-five, but forty-two years old, thirty-eight years old. I, I get stories all over, and they would, I think, rather do a lot more extra colonoscopies to find that one extra cancer. And all I'm going to say about that is follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, <laughs> Dr. Landry, thank you so much. So if we could just give our panelists and moderator one more round of applause. We have these wonderful gifts for all of you. Uh, thank you for your time. And I want to say thank you to the audience for engaging uh, us in uh, such a thoughtful discussion around um, a variety of topics. I really think it shows sort of the depth uh, and breadth of the experience of you all in the audience and also uh, how we all can work together to address some of these issues. And I think uh, as we talked about stepping out of our silos, I think there's opportunities for us to partner, whether it's in research or advocacy, um, policy change, uh, or education. Uh, this is the space that these conversations start. Um, so let's continue to have these discussions. Uh, with that, I just want to highlight a um, few other um, uh, equity and social justice events we have coming up. Uh, on October 10th, we have a dinner for Muslim students, trainees, and faculty. On October 17th, we have our LGBTQ and allies um, reception. October 23rd, we have a discussion around imposter syndrome. Uh, October 28th, we have a discussion around celebrating the 50 years of diversity and inclusion at HMS and HSDM. Uh, we have a conversation around diversity in graduate medical education on November 4th. Uh, and then we have a, uh, another equity and social justice lecture series on veterans' health. All of this information is available on the back of your, um, your pamphlets that you received. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you again to the panelists um, and to uh, our moderator. Thank you to the DICP staff for supporting this. We have uh, coffee and uh, light snacks in the back of the room for a time for congregation and uh, fellowship. And with that, we will end this uh, ESJ. Thank you.